Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Dr. William Fry, who is a senior research director of the Center for Memory and Aging at the Health Partners Neuroscience Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. uh, Fry's focus has been the use of non-invasive intranasal method for bypassing the blood-brain barrier to target therapeutic agents to the brain to treat neurological and psychiatric disorders while reducing unwanted side effects. These conditions include mild cognitive impairment, stroke, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and other brain diseases. He is also a faculty member in the graduate program in neuroscience at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Bill. Thank you so much, Gil. It's great to be here. I want to um, sort of rewind time a little bit and go back to uh, one of your uh, papers from 2009. I know that you have been working in this area for a long time. And this paper is entitled Internasal Delivery of Cells to the Brain, in which you say the safety and efficacy of cell-based therapies for neurodegenerative diseases depends on the mode of cell administration. We hypothesize that intranasally administered cells could, could, could bypass the blood-brain barrier by migrating from the nasal mucosa into the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, before we set off, uh, Bill, if you could um, you know, kind of briefly describe what the blood-brain barrier is and why it exists and, um, and, and why we have to actually get through it sometimes. Sure. Um, You know, the brain is our most important organ, not that we could live without many of the different organs that we have, (laughs) but the brain controls the functioning really of all the other organ systems. And for this reason, we as humans uh, and other animals as well have evolved a specialized barrier that protects the brain from things that we might be exposed to from the environment. So when you eat things or drink things or get things, uh, you know, injected into you that go into your bloodstream uh, substances by, by almost any route, those substances can easily go to your liver, your kidneys, your heart, and your lungs. Yeah. But the brain is protected by this blood-brain barrier. And it only allows really uh, small molecules and generally things that are fat soluble, what might be soluble in olive oil, for example, to pass through Hmm. from the bloodstream into the brain. Uh, Now, of course, there are certain uh, carriers in this blood brain barrier that allow the brain to take up uh, certain specific substances. But this is very good because it does protect the brain from things that we might ingest that otherwise would rapidly damage the brain or things that we might uh, inject or what have you into the body. Mm -hmm. 
unfortunately, when it comes to treating brain disorders uh, that can be very serious, uh, like stroke or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, et cetera, the blood-brain barrier then becomes a problem because it limits the kinds of therapeutic agents or drugs or biologic therapeutics that you might be able to use to treat those disorders. Right. And that is really the major reason why uh, it has taken us so long to develop effective treatments for these brain disorders. Um, yes. Yeah. So the, the small molecules, you, you, you said small molecules could pass through it, but large molecules cannot. So biologics tend to be very large molecules, so they cannot get through. Uh, but, but the typical small molecule chemistry, um, those things can get through? Those things can get through, although it uh, things that are uh, more fat soluble get through better. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there are certain small molecules. When we say small, uh, really to get through the blood brain barrier, many of these molecules need to be less than about 500 molecular weight. That means they're really pretty small. Yeah. Now, there, you know, recently there's been some reevaluation of, of the blood brain barrier, and people are starting to realize that there are things that are bigger than that that can in fact get through the blood-brain barrier. So fortunately, uh, in 1989, uh, when I was thinking about how to get around the problems of the blood-brain barrier, and I was quite frustrated about it, I went to sleep one night and I had a dream which actually uh, changed the direction of my research and gave me a clue yeah. to how to deal with this problem of the blood-brain barrier. And in the dream, I was arguing with other scientists and I was telling them that I thought the way to treat uh, Alzheimer's and other brain disorders, degenerative brain disorders, was with the natural therapeutic proteins that our body makes, mm -hmm. uh, things like nerve growth factors and insulin that could signal brain cells to repair worn out parts and provide more energy to brain cells. And when I said this to other scientists in my dream, they all said, well, it's not going to work because of the blood-brain barrier. And that's when I remembered something that I think everyone knew in, 19, in the 1980s, which is that sometimes harmful things would get into our nose yeah. and would actually cause damage to the brain by traveling from the nose to the brain along the nerves involved in smell. An example of this would be people who swim in polluted water and get amoebas in their nose and die of amoebic infection of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I woke up, I was quite excited by this. And before I even did experiments, I actually wrote and filed a patent application yeah. about intranasal delivery of neurologic agents to treat brain disorders. And that is what led us in the direction of, of starting to seriously look first in animals and then in humans at bypassing this barrier by giving therapeutics intranasally. Yeah, so when, we, uh, when you were doing this 2009 paper, were you specifically looking at insulin or were you looking at more generally how to get, uh, how to deliver agents into the brain? Well, the, we, we first looked at insulin before 2009. We actually started thinking about insulin yeah. uh, in um, uh, 2001. And we re I received a patent on the use of intranasal insulin to treat Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I actually, with the insulin, I did not do animal studies. I actually... Uh, contacted um, Dr. Suzanne Kraft, uh, who, is, uh, who is also a PhD like me. Yeah. Uh, but I contacted her because I had seen that she had an interest in insulin and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so I met up with her at a scientific conference and took her aside and told her that I had developed this intranasal method for delivering insulin to the brain, which could bypass this blood-brain barrier. At first, she wasn't clear on why I wanted to do it intranasally, but we sat down and had a conversation, and she also became very excited about this. Hmm. And she fortunately uh, had collaborators who were physicians who could then head up a clinical trial, 
And that led up to our first clinical trial looking at intranasal insulin uh, in people with mild cognitive impairment and also Alzheimer's disease. Right. Uh, by the time we actually conducted that trial, uh, researchers in Germany had uh, learned of our work uh, in this intranasal insulin and had shown in 2004 that when given to normal healthy adults, it actually improved their memory and made their memory better than normal. Hmm. And it did so without altering the blood level of insulin or glucose. So, yeah, I, I have a quick uh, question, yes. uh, Bill. So I have a confusion. So uh, I was at Pfizer in the 90s. And as you know, Pfizer had a product called Inhaled Insulin, uh, which came to market under the brand name Exubra. Yes. And um, it didn't it didn't quite succeed for a variety of reasons, including including the device. Uh, but then follow on products by other companies were also did not succeed uh, for for other reasons, including uh, long term chronic uh, lung disease. What we're talking about here is not um, getting anything into the lung. Uh, so so what's the what's the difference between inhaled and intranasal? Sure, that's a really good question. So yes, Pfizer was targeting the lungs to get the insulin there in order to get it into the bloodstream. And inhaled generally means breathing into the lungs, whether it's from the nose or the mouth. Okay. Intranasal, in the sense that we are using it, means really targeting the nasal cavity mm. and spraying a therapeutic into the nose and in fact, in our situation, we're targeting really the upper third of the nasal cavity because we know that when therapeutics like insulin are given intranasally, they can travel directly into the brain along the nerves involved in smell, like mm -hmm. the olfactory nerves, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and also the trigeminal nerves, which have nerve endings in the nasal mucosa. And when these drugs like insulin are sprayed into the nasal cavity, they actually follow the nerve fibers or axon bundles of the olfactory nerves that are collected into bundles that go through the roof of the nasal cavity. There are little holes in the skull there, the part of the skull called the cribriform plate. Yeah. And these nerve bundles go up into the subarachnoid space of the brain. So the insulin goes from the nose directly into the brain without having to enter the bloodstream. And once in the brain, the insulin can then be distributed throughout the brain by following the blood vessels of the brain, the cerebrovasculature. But in this case, the insulin is already on the brain side of the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So by giving the insulin intranasally, you're avoiding systemic exposure to the insulin. You're not delivering it to the other organs of the body yeah. and you are delivering it into the brain. And the, the insulin travels uh, along the blood vessels on the brain side of the blood brain barrier and is able to reach key brain regions like the hippocampus that is involved in memory, where the insulin can actually signal brain cells to take up glucose and provide more energy uh, which, which we know occurs in humans because we can see it with imaging. We actually can see the cellular ATP or energy go up. Yeah, we will, we will, uh, we will yes. get to that. Uh, so if I understand this, Bill, so there, there are two things here, right? One is the method of delivery, uh, which is if you can intranasally apply an agent, you can actually go through the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. And uh, it could be a variety of agents, right? For example, in 2011, you have a paper, you, you said therapeutic efficacy of intranasally delivered stem cells in a rat model for Parkinson's disease. Right. So, and I, would say, I would just say, we're not going through the blood-brain barrier, we're yeah. bypassing it. You're bypassing it, yeah. Yes. So it almost like when you did the wiring, there was a bit of a gap there, <laughs> you know, yes. if I understand this correctly. Yes. Uh, that's right. And so once we realized, because not only do we need to get these therapeutics for brain disorders into the brain, 
but we also want to avoid adverse side effects. We don't want to load up the bloodstream uh, with these therapeutics. And, and this uh, method that we discovered uh, seems to accomplish that for many, many therapeutic agents for treating different disorders. Yeah, and so the, this Parkinson's disease uh, paper that you have, that you are trying actually stem cells to be delivered to the brain, right? So what's, yes. the, uh, what's the background there? Sure. The rat models? So, well, of course, stem cells, and these are, to clarify, these are adult cells, yeah. uh, adult stem cells. And these, and stem cells, what we call mesenchymal stem cells, are highly anti-inflammatory. And we know that brain disorders like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, and other degenerative brain disorders involve inflammation and inflammatory damage to the brain. Yeah. So the idea is that if we have therapeutic cells and stem cells are, are smart cells uh, and they're anti-inflammatory, if we could intranasally deliver them into the brain of an animal or a human, uh, that has Parkinson's, this should help to treat the disease. And we, in fact, did this in, in an animal uh, model where we took, in this case, a rat, and the rat had Parkinson's only on one side of the brain. Uh, and we were able to show that when you intranasally deliver these adult uh, stem cells from bone marrow that are derived from bone marrow, yeah. that those cells actually don't just go in the brain, they go only to the areas of damage in the brain, the areas where there is Parkinson's damage. They are attracted to those areas of damage. They're able to move in that direction by chemotaxis. They can detect chemicals released in damage and they migrate specifically to where the damaged dopamine brain cells are in Parkinson's. And even though these are bone marrow stem cells, which never have produced dopamine before, never had to in the bone marrow, they recognize first that there's inflammation there and they eliminate that inflammation. And second, they begin to produce dopamine and release it because they can see that dopamine is needed. So this is a way of delivering these little stem cell doctors directly, not just to the brain, but to the damaged areas of the brain so that they can then use their capabilities to actually treat the disorder. So we saw in this model, not just that we eliminated the inflammation and we released the dopamine, but that over a period of two weeks after the, the stem cell treatment, that the animals began to recover their ability to move. In, right very significantly. So, so the action, there the are two actions. One is the reduction of inflammation, and yes. the other is almost like a repair um, yes. that is being done, right? So you, uh, another paper you have in 2013, uh, specifically about, uh, again, intranasal stem cell, adult stem cell treatment for neonatal uh, brain damage, uh, where you're showing long-term cognitive and sens sensory motor improvement. This uh, work, yeah. yeah, this work was not work that we did. So once we published, uh, first of all, there, there, the in the Netherlands, Cindy van Velthoven uh, is the stem cell researcher there, who first showed that intranasal stem cells would treat neonatal brain damage and neonatal ischemia, and she and her collaborators uh, published, I think, the paper you're referring to, whereas. Uh, our stem cell work was done by Dr. Lucina Daniellen in, the, in Tübingen at the University Hospital of Tübingen, where um, uh, uh, she carried out this Parkinson's study that we just discussed. Okay, okay. And I don't know who the authors are of this one, uh, Bill. So intranasal insulin to treat and protect against post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, here you know, you're looking at 26 healthy adult men minutes before they were exposed to some sort of social stress test, right. a placebo control, double blind, uh, between subject design significantly. So uh, could, you, could you describe a bit about the design of that study? Sure, sure. So first of all, as I mentioned, we had, uh, we had developed intranasal insulin and we had found in clinical trials and trials that were done by initially 
uh, well, by a number of different groups, that it improved memory safely. Yeah. Now, in Germany, in 2008, uh, Dr. Boehringer and his coll colleagues took adult men uh, and carried out a clinical trial where these men were exposed to stress. Hmm. And when humans are exposed to stress, the stress hormone cortisol is increased. Uh, and if the men in his trial were given a nasal spray that was a placebo that just had uh, saline in it, yeah. uh, the men showed increases in cortisol in response to the stress that they were exposed to. Whereas when he gave them intranasal insulin, it dramatically attenuated uh, the increase in cortisol. It, it, uh, the, there's an entire um, process that begins in the brain uh, and that in the hypothalamus and, go and sends signals to the pituitary and then to the adrenal glands. And this then results in the production of cortisol in response to stress. And this entire process was greatly reduced in men that had been given intranasal insulin. So I wrote a paper about uh, providing the strategy for using intranasal insulin to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, in part based on the work that had been done in Germany. Uh, and this has not been done in men who actually have PTSD yet. Right, right. You know, that's something that we are looking forward to doing. Yeah, so let's talk about insulin a bit more. So uh, intranasal insulin treatment, um, both for neurodegenerative diseases, but also traumatic brain injury. Yes. Um, and... I believe there is, uh, so, so if you, if you th think about the whole system now, I believe uh, there is a, there's a term coined uh, type 3 diabetes of the brain uh, for Alzheimer's. Well, yes. So, uh, so after, we, uh, after we and others showed that intranasal insulin could improve memory, uh, in, first it was shown in, in Germany uh, by uh, Christian Benedict, Jan Born, and many others in, in, in their groups, uh, that intranasal insulin given to normal healthy adults actually improved their memory to make it better than normal. And then Dr. Suzanne Kraft and I reported intranasal, and others, uh, Mark Rieger and others, uh, showed that intranasal insulin improved memory in people with mild cognitive impairment, even a single dose, a single treatment uh, would improve memory within 15 minutes. And then a number of other trials were carried out. And what's uh, our understanding of the mechanism there, Bill? Is it, yes. is it that, you know, just like a type 2 diabetes, um, is, it, is it sort of an energy problem in the brain? It's, yes. So in, in type 2 diabetes, uh, you have what is called insulin resistance. Yeah. In type 1 diabetes, you have a, def a simple deficiency of insulin being produced because of the uh, by the pancreas. Right. So in in adult onset diabetes, there is not enough insulin signaling, a uh, functional insulin signaling taking place in the body as a whole, and th therefore cells are not being told to take up glucose the way they should be, and therefore the blood level of glucose rises because mm -hmm. glucose isn't being taken out of the bloodstream into the cells. And of course, with type 2 diabetes, sometimes people are treated by injecting subcutaneously insulin into the body, which goes into the bloodstream, that then tells the cells to take up blood sugar, and that helps to treat that disorder. Now, realize, uh, you know, that insulin was developed uh, in the 1920s uh, by Eli Lilly. Yes. So before, before that, uh, uh, people who had diabetes did not live very long. Uh, we know, for example, that in 1900, the average lifespan for women was about 50. And so in, when insulin was developed in the 1920s and later as it became available for treating people with type 2 diabetes, then people who had diabetes could live longer. Hmm. And when you have diabetes, that doubles your risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. Because Alzheimer's, in Alzheimer's disease, the brain has insulin resistance and there is not enough insulin signaling in the brain 
to tell the brain cells to take up glucose in key brain regions like the hippocampus. And therefore, brain cells are starved for energy. Now, we can see this in brain scans of people with Alzheimer's. There is a kind of brain scan uh, called a PET scan, an FDG or glucose PET scan. Yeah. And if you look at normal, healthy adults and you look at the brain, the brain lights up. You see glucose being taken up into the brain and providing energy. But in people with Alzheimer's, the brain is almost dark. So there is not sufficient uptake of glucose and not enough brain cell energy. Without that energy, brain cells cannot replace parts as they wear out and the cells degenerate and they cannot carry out normal functions uh, like memory, you know. Right. Uh, but insulin does many good things in the brain and that is, is just one of them. So insulin resistance uh, in type two diabetes, Bill, that, that is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The body has the insulin, but it's not the body's not able to use it properly, right? Um, is that what's happening with insulin resistance? Well, yes. Although the receptors for insulin are are not functioning normally, but we know that with people who have type two diabetes, that they are helped. Many of them are helped by taking insulin. Yeah, but is it uh, just sort of overloading the body with insulin so that, you know... You're getting more insulin to get more insulin signaling. Yeah. Just as with intranasal insulin, we are providing more insulin into the brain right. to help the brain not only produce more energy, which we can, we can also see by imaging and living people, that more energy is produced, uh, but also... Insulin is required for maintaining nerve connections and for doing many other uh, things in the brain that the brain needs to stay healthy. So, so do we have any correlation between, I guess, when you are type 2 diabetic, if, it is, if you're taking medication um, like metformin or something like that, uh, or uh, you're introducing insulin into the body, you are treating that. Uh, but uh, is there any correlation to untreated uh, type 2 diabetes and, and, uh, and Alzheimer's? Well, yes. Having type 2 diabetes doubles your risk for Alzheimer's. Okay. okay. We know. Um, and, uh, but e that's true even with the fact that diabetics are obviously being treated peripherally. They're, in, you know, uh, outside of the brain, they are taking medications uh, that are helping them with their diabetes. But in spite yeah, so of, that, that doesn't get into the brain though, right? That's one of the issues. So Well, it might get into the brain, but it's not solving this problem. Yes, some of it might reach the brain, but okay. people are looking at, people are looking now at intranasally delivering, not just insulin as we have done, but, uh, but other diabetic drugs. Yeah. So, so the intranasal, the, the improvement in memory with intranasal insulin has led to newer studies uh, with uh, drugs like GLP-1, uh, which is another diabetic drug. Uh, uh, and and uh, people are also looking at metformin. And right. some of these, some of these, they are looking at intranasally as well. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this, Bill. There was a there was something that came out last week, um, and you know it basically talks about in multiple sclerosis, uh, the protective coating surrounding nerves is damaged, causing them to become less energy efficient, which makes them vulnerable to further damage and causes disability. Uh, this is something out of University of Edinburgh, and basically uh, the bottom line here is that they are saying MS could be treated using a diabetes drug, uh, pioglitazone. Right, right. So MS, let, let, I'm glad you asked about this. So MS is a disorder that also has uh, memory impairment. About 30% yeah. of MS patients have memory impairment. And in fact, Johns Hopkins uh, was carrying out a clinical trial of intranasal insulin to see if it would improve memory in people with multiple sclerosis. And that trial was listed on the clinicaltrials.gov website. Yeah. But the most important thing that I, I will tell you about MS is you, you sort of summed it up a minute ago 
We know that the big problem in MS is failure to keep the nerves myelinated. Hmm. So it's a demyelinating disorder. And in fact, it is the oligodendrocytes. These are particular cells that are charged with keeping uh, cells myelinated in the brain. Uh, and remyelination is thought to be defective in MS because these oligodendrocytes do not have enough energy mm -hmm. to carry out the remyelination process. The other thing we know about oligodendrocytes is that they, their surface is covered with insulin receptors. Yeah. So you would expect that intranasal insulin could signal those cells through their insulin receptors and help them take up glucose and produce more energy so that they would then be more effective at carrying out remyelination. No one has tried this, however, yet in people with MS uh, and looked at whether or not they can increase remyelination. But that is certainly something we would like to see done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very encouraging, right? So if, if we are saying that, uh, you know, we can treat some of these conditions using uh, generally available diabetes drugs uh, like bioglitazone or, or metformin. Right. Uh, that has huge implications, right? It sure does. It sure does. And, and in, your, in, in your case, um, essentially making it much more efficient you can, so you can deliver directly uh, to the site uh, what is needed. And, and, and I guess you can control that dose very nicely. Uh, but what do we know about the migration paths uh, once it gets into the brain through the nasal cavity? You're talking about the, the, ins the insulin, yeah. Yes. So we know, um, we know where the insulin goes, and we've published the results about this in animals. Of yeah. course, in humans, it's a, a little trickier. But the insulin is going to get to the regions of the brain where there are insulin receptors, and that is where it's going to act. So uh, once the insulin reaches the brain, uh, uh, it will act on cells that have insulin receptors. And as I mentioned before, uh, if we take uh, uh, normal healthy adults, you can actually use magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, yeah. but use a phosphorus 31 uh, label. And you can see that the high energy phosphate compounds showing increased brain cell energy go up after intranasal insulin. And that has already been reported in humans in the literature. And we see both sort of a tactical benefit in terms of memory uh, but I guess more studies are needed to uh, to conclude on sort of a strategic effects, right? Can we actually yeah. treat treat uh, Alzheimer's in this manner? Right, right. We we obviously we need a lot more studies. Um, also, let me ex tell you that another thing that we've learned is that the actual devices that are used to deliver the insulin to the brain. Yeah. Uh, are also important. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Kraft uh, recently completed a trial and published the results uh, uh, where she discusses and talks about issues involved in these nasal spray devices. So we not only need more research and a better understanding of all the things that insulin is doing in the brain, but we also need better devices for targeting the insulin intranasally so that we actually successfully deliver it in a uniform manner to the brain. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's possible, but in the very long run, you could imagine a very small device implanted, right? That, that could be programmatically, uh, you know, delivering sufficient amount of insulin. You could. Also, there are various formulations that you might be able to use to provide, you know, a more sustained release yeah. uh, from the nasal mucosa as well. Uh, there are, and you know, uh, Alzheimer's is a complicated disease. There are people who uh, have a gene alteration in the uh, what's called the ApoE gene. It's a gene that carries cholesterol. Yeah. And if you have type four of this gene, 
you're at higher risk for getting Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. If you have type two, you're actually at reduced risk for getting Alzheimer's. And type three is what the majority of people have. Yeah. And in fact, intranasal insulin, regular insulin does not improve memory in people who have type four APOE genes. Mm -hmm. But if you use long acting insulin intranasally, it has been shown to improve memory in that population. So, you know, there are obviously a lot of details and complications involved in the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just like type 2 diabetes, I, I guess this would be, if at all, it would be a chronic treatment regimen, right? I mean, uh, yes. it, right? Yeah. Yes. Right now, most trials are administering the insulin twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening intranasally. Yeah. And of course, most diabetics inject their insulin uh, twice a day uh, as well. Right, right. Yeah, I want to talk a bit about uh, a very topical item, uh, Bill, which is COVID-19. Sure. And uh, don't, want to, <laughs> don't want to scare anybody, but you say that in addition to its adverse effects on the lungs, COVID-19 can also rapidly transport into the brain leading to problems with oxygen sensing and difficulty breathing. Uh, we have heard um, anecdotally and also now that sufficient data, I think, uh, in terms of loss of smell and other type of, um, other type of symptoms. Yeah. Uh, so, so what do we know about this and uh, well, what can we do? Yes, I'm glad you brought this up. So first of all, I think your audience will know that um, COVID-19 accumulates in the nasal cavity, in the nose. Yeah. And that is, in fact, why people do nasal swabs to determine if a person has the uh, coronavirus, this particular coronavirus. Um, and we know that the uh, virus can travel from the nose through the nasopharynx down into the lungs, hmm. where it can cause acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this can uh, damage the lungs quite severely in some people and obviously increase their risk of dying uh, uh, in that way. Yeah. But it has been known since the 1900s that viruses that get into the nose can often also transmit directly from the nose to the brain. And they can, in fact, follow these same nerves that we've discussed earlier, the olfactory and trigeminal nerve pathways, from the nose into the brain. And of course, the virus is very inflammatory and it can, it, it can lead to what's called a cytokine storm. The cytokines in this case being very inflammatory uh, peptides or proteins. Yeah. And inflammation in the brain damages the brain. Now, uh, other coronaviruses have actually been shown directly to go into the brain uh, uh, in, in humans. Uh, and um, we know, for example, that if you go back to 1918 and this, the very critical flu pandemic uh, that occurred then where millions of people died worldwide, yeah. that the people who's, who got infected with the 1918 pandemic virus who did not die mm -hmm. often went on decades later to develop brain disorders, in particular Parkinson's disease or a Parkinsonian type mm -hmm. disease. So I think it is quite likely, we, we, let me just say, we also know that there can be acute neurologic problems that occur in people who have the coronavirus infection. And those have been reported in the literature. Yeah. So it's quite likely that this coronavirus will also be able to transport into the brain. And it's sort of, it would be sort of naive for us to assume that there may not be long-term neurologic consequences of the COVID-19 infection in people who get the infection and survive, you know, survive the acute infection. Uh, you know, one sort of analogy to this, uh, other than the 1918 flu pandemic, yeah. we know that children who get chicken pox get over the chicken pox. Mm -hmm. The virus remains in the body. Right. And years later, people can develop shingles 
based on the same virus that they had as a child. So I think this is something that we need to be aware of as a real possibility here. Hmm. Obviously, we cannot know for sure what is going to happen years later until we get to years later. <laughs> and the virus, you know, the pandemic only started, at least in the U.S., uh, uh, in 2020. Yeah. So we, we, we don't have absolute proof that this will happen, of course. But I think that this is really important because, number one, I've already told you that stem cells, adult stem cells, let's say from bone marrow, are highly anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So one possibility would be that we could actually intranasally deliver adult anti-inflammatory stem cells into the nose where the virus is. Mm -hmm. These stem cells would be like fire trucks chasing the inflammatory virus up the same nerve pathways into the brain. So I think that the intranasal stem cell treatment that we've developed and that people around the world are looking at right now in animal models of disease uh, and finding effectiveness there. Yeah. I think that this might be a possible way to actually help treat the inflammatory virus or the inflammatory cytokines from the virus that reach the brain. And this, this is also important from a policy perspective. Yeah. You know, we hear so much now about, well, Children uh, are not very susceptible to dying from <laughs> coronavirus. You hear, you hear people saying this. Uh, or young adults might get the virus, but they might just have a mild case. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we send, before we decide that it's okay for children or okay for young, healthy adults to get this virus, we need to consider the possibility that even if they survive it, even if they don't have major adverse side effects at, at this time, that doesn't mean that out in the future, this exposure won't have serious consequences for them. And I think that our uh, governors and, uh, you know, uh, federal uh, 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 administration people need to keep that in mind when deciding uh, how significant it is for for uh, people uh, that are young uh, to to be exposed to this virus. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, the politicians have you know four year four year horizons for making decisions. Yeah, and uh, it may not quite uh, fit with the with the disease pattern. So, from a policy perspective, what I'm hearing, Bill, you know, one thing is. This idea that we can get to herd immunity by infecting 60% of the population uh, in the absence of a vaccine uh, is a non-starter, right? Yes, I think so. And, and, and even yeah. after, what you're saying is that even after somebody recovers, whether it is asymptomatic, uh, mild symptoms or otherwise, uh, there has to be some sort of a monitoring, uh, monitoring system in place uh, because yes. if we can pick it up early enough, what you're suggesting is that there might be ways we can intervene with it. That's exactly right. You you said it better than I could, and I'm I, I am concerned because you hear so little about the neurologic consequences. Now, researchers in Spain have done an amazing job uh, reporting about the acute neurologic consequences of this uh, COVID infection uh, in the brain. And, uh, and, and I think that's very encouraging. And I know that we have researchers here in the United States who are certainly looking into uh, what's happened in the brains of people who have had this infection. Uh, but I think that uh, the public in general and the policymakers um, are not thinking that far ahead. And I think that could turn out to be a very serious mistake. Just if they, if they just think about what happened to people who survived the uh, 1918 pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So, so in conclusion, Bill, um, you know, if you look forward uh, four or five years, um, I know that you're doing a lot of research in Health Partners Neuroscience Center. And by the way, that is uh, supported by uh, foundations and external funding. Um, 
by private companies and parties? Yes, uh, yes, we are a nonprofit research center and uh, all of our work is funded uh, by grants or by f other foundations. We have uh, two foundations that help partners, of course, also nonprofits, and uh, by donations from people across the world that uh, are supporting our work as well. Uh, and uh, of course, we've been uh, slowed down quite a bit by the pandemic. Uh, several of our clinical trials we had a clinical trial going on for intranasal insulin in Parkinson's. We had another trial going on in frontotemporal dementia uh, that, that both of these were temporarily suspended because of the coronavirus. Um, uh, but uh, all of these are supported either by uh, philanthropy or by grants. Uh, 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 and uh, we we always appreciate any help we get. <laughs> yeah, I will I will include the details if somebody wants to get in touch with you. I'll include those details in the in the write up. Um, but in terms of you know looking forward five years, um, what what do you see? Uh, you know, let me ask you differently. What are the areas that you're most excited about, and where do you think we will make the the biggest leaps in terms of whether it's a diagnostics or or treatment? Well, I think uh, obviously I'm very, very excited about all the intranasal therapies that have been developed since, you know, we started reporting about nose to brain delivery in 1989. And uh, there are so many of these, we've talked about a number of them today. Um, uh, another area that we didn't really get into is we know that iron accumulates abnormally yeah. in the brains of people with all these disorders, whether it's MS or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and you can deliver intranasally iron binding drugs into the brain, which are quite effective in animals and uh, treating stroke, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. So there are a number of these therapies that I think we're going to see move into human clinical trials, and I am hopeful that they will be both safe and effective. Yeah, and, and that's the oxidative stress issue, right? With iron yep, in the is. brain. That is correct. And so, so what, what you're saying in general is that there could be a lot of different agents. It doesn't necessarily yeah. just, the, just insulin, but um, it's almost like, a, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it, it's almost like a cleanup operation <laughs> that, uh, that needs to be done in some systematic way in the brain. I think that's true. You're, in some cases, you're, you're sending signal in, signals in to increase brain cell energy so the brain can repair itself better. Yeah. In other instances, you're sending in the doctors, the, the stem cells and other cells that can actually diagnose the problem, go to the right spot and produce what's needed, like little biologic factories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can deliver gene therapy intranasally. Uh, you know, in people that are missing, born missing enzymes in the brain, you can deliver the gene to produce those enzymes in the brain or deliver the enzyme itself. There are so many things, uh, treating brain tumors uh, this way with therapeutic cells uh, has already been reported in animals. And we, we hope to see this uh, moved into people as well. Yeah, I know that we didn't get that time for that. I just uh, quickly mentioned uh, the, what is it, the, the blastoma, the glioblastoma. Yes. Uh, and again, that is an issue that we can't get in there to, to treat it. And that's what happened uh, to um, Senator McCain as well, right? Yes. yes. And, and again, this might be an opportunity for us to, for us to potentially treat certain diseases uh, right now doesn't really have any, any effective treatment. Exactly. Yes. Excellent. Excellent, Bill. Uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for this. Thanks so much for uh, spending time with me. And well, thank uh, you, yeah, and good luck with all your research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.